I'm good. Yeah. Actually, yeah, I'll, I'll just add nothing. I'll just be silent. The three hour video. I'll just sit here and just watch. I won't even say a fucking word for the three hours. I like that. I like that idea. Dude, this, guys, this is why I never watch a fucking Wendigoon video ever on my channel. I'm not watching to a, I'm not watching a video from talking for three hours. I can't do it. I just can't. I can't do it. <laughs> like even on my own, I can't do it. I don't know if it's because, you know, my ADHD or something, but I, I can't just sit there and watch a video for three fucking hours to listen to him talk. I can't do that. It's I can't. It's impossible. I don't know how people do it, man. Hue Pedro Teixeira Mendoza was only 11 when he disappeared from his home in Lusada, northern Portugal. At approximately 2pm on the 4th of March 1998, Hue took his bike outside for a ride close to his home. He would never come back inside. Why? Prior to vanishing, Hue, a happy and social boy, had asked his mother if he could spend the day riding in a car with their family friend. <clears throat> you know, what if like there was ever one of these like missing children uh, documentaries and instead of them because they always do that thing where they're like he was a, a, a loving kind uh, a, a beautiful boy he was so positive and happy all the time what if they were just like he was the fucking worst he was a terrible child I hated dealing with him he everyone in the neighborhood despised him and he was so freaking annoying like what if they did that because you know 90% of the time it's just bullshit. Like when they say, oh, he was, he, he lit up everyone's day. He was the kindest child ever. What if he was a little shit? Like what if he sucked, you know? What if Alfonso he was an Diaz, annoying piece of shit? A 22 shit? Exactly. year old lorry driver. But Hui's mother was quite fond of Alfonso and allowed him to drive her children to school most days. She knew that her husband didn't approve of such an older man hanging out with their son. And as such, she told Hue to take his bike to the vacant field behind her office. However, it was possible that the excited Hue disobeyed his mother and went to see his cool, older friend, Alfonso, a man he viewed as a brother. Uh, Suspecting that he may have been involved in Hue's disappearance, that's the not authorities good. paid a visit to Alfonso's home. <clears throat> Under questioning, Alfonso apparently became an emotional wreck and although he said he didn't know what happened to Hue, he did tell investigators that they should close the borders. Hi. His cousin, Zhou, would later tell authorities that on the day he went missing, <clears throat> Alfonso had actually taken Hue to see an escort. See, he doesn't even listen to Alcina his mom. Diash. Yeah, he's a piece of shit, dude. Alcina later confirmed shit, that kid. Alfonso and Hue had come to see her that fateful afternoon, and claimed that Hue was scared and upset. It was clear to Alcina that Alfonso had forced him to come and see her. She told Alfonso to take Hue back home, and the pair left in his car. That was the last confirmed sighting of Hue Mendoza. After running a local media campaign to find <coughs> Hue Pedro, the authorities received many hoax calls from individuals claiming to have the missing boy and demanding ransoms. Perhaps the most chilling calls were placed directly to Hue Pedro's own mother. She would sometimes answer her phone and be met by a wailing child's voice, repeatedly saying, Mama, Mama. She was certain that the voice was her son's. Dude, if they're trolling, the that's fuck. Never attempted. Like, who does that shit, man? You know what? Teenagers. Who, like, who am I even kidding? I, like, obviously that's the answer. Okay. But, like, who, like, sees a sign, missing child? I mean, it's teenagers. I don't like I, again. I don't even say it. But who sees that sign? Just like <laughs> we're gonna call this de de depressed, uh, extremely distraught mother who just lost her child and, and act like we found him. To trace these calls, their investigation was met with widespread criticism. With many Portuguese citizens asserting that they put little effort into finding the missing boy especially when compared with the huge efforts that they would later put in trying to track down missing British tourist Madeline McCann. Yo, what's going on with her eye? Is 
is she is she like is she like like the the first stage of the showering gun or some shit? What's going on? I've never seen that shit before. One month after Hue went missing, Nuno Rogero, a political commentator, traveled to Disneyland Paris with his family. A birthmark? You can have a birthmark on your eyeball. Trip, Nuno snapped countless pictures of what he thought would be priceless memories. I just say, if that was me, I just I just say I'm. I'm producing a sharing. Like I'm growing it into uh, you know, my my teen years. Gaining my sharing gun. But as he browsed through them when he got <clears> back home, he noticed something in one or of the a broken he had taken. I've never heard of that before. A familiar face, which he had seen on the news. Oh shit. On one of the <laughs> roller coaster rides, sitting in the back carriage, was a boy who looked identical to Hue. He was pictured sitting beside an unidentified man in a red jacket, whose face was obscured. This image was confiscated by investigators, and although it's never been 100% confirmed that this was Hue, it's widely believed by most people, including his own mother, to be him. Due in large part to poor investigative work, the photo itself didn't result in any further leads. Of course it didn't. On September 1st, 1998, Authorities conducted a raid targeting members of the Wonderland Club, an international <laughs> ring. During the operation, they discovered and seized a staggering 750,000. Whoa! Dear Lord. Why images and videos, Why does it always have to... Which in total uh, featured 1,263 Jesus youths. Christ. What the Only hell Only 16 were ever successful. No. I'm gonna make this fucking small get out of here. That's fully identified. Hue was one of them. In 2012, of course. Alfonso Diash was acquitted of any wrongdoing due to a lack of compelling <laughs> evidence. However, in 2014, he received a three-year sentence for corruption of an innocent. Notably, he was- So, like, what did he do? Did he, like, convince him to run away or some shit? <clears throat> Never formally yeah, you walked in at the worst possible time. In relation time. to Huey's disappearance. After serving two-thirds of his three-year sentence, Alfonso Diaz was released. Despite an extensive search effort, Huey has never been found. Though at this point, his fate seems all too clear. He was declared legally dead in 2019. Dude, I hate when these things have to do with children, man. I fucking hate it. Before we move on to the next mysterious photo, I'd sponsor? like to introduce you all to today's mysterious sponsor, June's Journey, the free-to-download murder mystery game with a vintage 1920s aesthetic. Where in the world is Carmen San Diego? That's an interesting one. Then help support the channel by downloading June's Journey for free using my QR code on screen. Yeah, I've never or seen Or click this my link before. in the description. Interesting. Okay, 18. Okay, not a child, so not as bad. Let's watch Coraline. Yeah, let's do that. Natalie Ann on Twitch. 18. Let's see what happens. Disappeared on May 30th. 2005, Nothing while on a high school happen, graduation sure. trip with classmates in Aruba. <clears throat> this photo, which shows Natalie socializing with friends on the night she vanished, is believed to be the last ever picture showing her alive. Shortly after this image was taken, Natalie would go into one of the back rooms to party with Dutch honor student Joran van der Sloot and his two Surinamese friends. Van der Sloot? Damn. The Kalpo brothers, Deepak and Satish. After getting into a car with the three men at approximately 1.30 a.m., Natalie was never seen again. When questioned, Joran, Deepak, and Satish no claimed to have dropped Natalie off at her hotel I don't know what and you're denied any about. knowledge of her whereabouts. <clears throat> Law enforcement subsequently arrested Joran van der Sloot twice on suspicion of involvement in her disappearance, while the Kalpo brothers were taken into custody on three separate occasions. However, due to a lack of substantial evidence, None of the suspects were ever formally charged in relation to Natalie's case. On December 18th, 2007, more than two years after Natalie went missing, Aruban prosecutors declared the case closed. Just a few months later, 
Dude, Feb- why are cops so fucking lazy, man? Why do they give up so quick? I mean, to be fair, it's like it's just one of those situations where anyone can become a cop. So like they can be really fucking stupid. So they so they just don't, you know, they just can't figure out anything, basically. It's <clears throat> it's not their job to protect people, yeah. <clears throat> February 1st, 2008. The prosecutor's office reopened the investigation following the emergency. Well, yeah, detectives and police. I mean, it's all of them. They literally said, fuck it, can't find anyone. All right, whatever. ...of an undercover video. One which purportedly featured Joran van der Sloot admitting <laughs> that he had God, killed Natalie like on the morning she vanished and that he had had a friend dispose of her. Joran later recanted these statements and, in a subsequent interview, claimed that he had actually sold Natalie to human traffickers. A well, that's the thing. Which he had- no shit that they can't keep looking forever, but, like, can they just, like, not be stupid? Like, this, this is a teen... We're talking about a teenager, man. We're talking about a teenager who murdered a teenager and you can't figure it out? You had a extremely strong lead and you're just like, eh, Sorry, don't got anything on him. I know there's like a bunch of situations where like you can't dig, you 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 need evidence in order to pursue, but it's like, come on, man. Again, withdrew. Given that Yoren's father was a high-ranking judge in Aruba, many suspect that a few strings may have been pulled to get him off the hook. In 2010, Joram van der Sloot was but indicted like by an American court for trying to extort a quarter of a million dollars like from Natalie's mother of power. in exchange I mean, for the money, Joram. Well, that's why it's a problem that anyone can become a cop, is, you know, that. It's like the equivalent of, uh, you know, teachers or, uh, you know, uh, people who work with children. It's the same shit. It's like you should you should need... Uh, higher qualifications and background checks because, you know, you're going to be around children. And what kind of uh, people want to work at places like that to be around a bunch of children? Predators. And what kind of people want to be in positions of power? People who are also predators in different ways. Or, I mean, maybe they are predators in that way too. You know, it's, it's just... I don't know. Said that he'd tell Natalie's family... I'm not, I'm not going to get into hidden. it. Her mother sent him a down payment. We're getting deep. But the information he gave her proved to be false. In January 2012, he was convicted of the murder of 21-year-old Stephanie Flores Ramirez in Lima, Peru. Didn't you see the mom that was looking for his son for seven months and it was actually the police's fault? An officer ran him over and killed him and they didn't tell her. You know, I'm... Yeah, I'm not even surprised, man. I, I genuinely am not even surprised. The amount of times that, like, cops have committed crimes and then the police do everything they can to protect that person is ridiculous. He had taken her on May 30th, 2010. Five years to the day after Natalie had disappeared. Per his confession, Joran had brought Stephanie back to his hotel room. When he wasn't looking, she went through his computer realized that he was indeed a suspect in Natalie's case oh, shit. and decided to confront him about it. Joran then took her life and was subsequently sentenced to 28 years behind bars. So the cops, wasn't a- the cops weren't able to do it, but just a random girl was able to do it. Okay. Like... Come on! Like... Come on, guys. It's believed really? that Stephanie may have found evidence on his computer which proved he was responsible for Natalie's slaying. On June 8th of this year, Joram was that's, extradited that's to my the birthday. United States to stand trial for extortion and wire fraud, and is expected to receive another heavy sentence. Even so, he's yet to stand trial for what he did to Natalie. Today, 18 years later, Natalie has officially been missing for as long as she was alive. Her whereabouts still remains a mystery. Though the leading theory is that Joran disposed of her. How come your equipment's sea. been breaking lately? It's not breaking. A recently discovered email sent by Joran to one of what his a, contacts. Wait, what? What else was? What's breaking? My dad oh. got a boat two days later, 
Something's breaking. We went for a ride and took care of things. That's all I'm gonna say. Natalie was declared legally dead in January 2012. Headphones? Well, that so was my fault. a quick fault. update about what's happened since I recorded this segment. Oh, no. I figured out the head, the, the reason my headphones were just cutting out. I don't know why they were cutting out, but after a factory reset of my computer, they work again. So it had to do with like audio. I have so much like audio programs on my computer is probably just like confusing my headphones. On October 18th, 2023, <clears throat> Joran van der Sloot officially confessed to taking Natalie Holloway's life. In exchange for a 20 year plea deal, he's agreed oh, to provide a full account of what happened to Natalie. The pair apparently walked to a lonely stretch of beach together. After Natalie rejected his advances, Joran claims to have smashed her head in with a cinder block and tossed Yeah, I think that's a pretty uh, average response whenever someone says no. Right, fellas? Come on, fellas. You guys know. It, I mean, it happens. It just happens. Like, 100% reasonable. Exactly. Oh, sorry. I'm just, I'm not really interested. Ah, oh, damn. Well, gotta hit you over the head with a cinder block now. And that's a normal thing to do. In the ocean. Deepak and Satish were apparently not involved. More details will no doubt emerge in the coming weeks and months. I see a huge cinder block laying on the, on the beach. Uh, I take this and uh, I, I, I smash her head in with it completely. Uh, yeah, her face basically, you know, uh, collapses in. Ah! Even though it's dark, I can see her face is collapsed in. Afterwards, I don't exactly know uh, what, uh, you know, I'm scared, I don't know what to do. Uh, You're scared? I, uh, I decided to, to take her and uh, uh, to put her into the ocean, so. Jesus Christ. In February 2013, residents of Morrisania in the Bronx awoke to several grim discoveries that were stumbled upon by innocent passers-by. The chopped up pieces of a human female. Pieces that were quickly identified as belonging to Tanya Bird, a 45-year-old local who lived with her <laughs> son, Basid McLean. When the authorities approached Basid and told them of his mother's slaying, he was, apparently, distraught, and told them that he hadn't been able to contact her for several days. In their search for evidence, detectives turned their attention to the surveillance cameras that lined the Bronx in an attempt to piece the case together, and, in doing so, came upon a surprising lead. Shortly after the incident had occurred, two men were caught on CCTV at a hardware store, purchasing a Black & Decker Real? power saw. This is the, the real type video? of instrument used to cut her remains into pieces. Jesus Christ. One of those men was Tanya's own son, Basil Whoa, McLean. Whoa, what? The other was a known associate of his, one William Morris. Her son? The two men were swiftly arrested, and each tried to pin the slaying on the other. Basig claimed that his friend, William, had come over to visit him, and after an argument, used a sharp blade to kill his mum. Out of a sense of obligation and law enforcement are are all are almost completely good people with good intentions filtering isn't perfect especially after defunding the police because someone got tased to death after killing people we're not going to get into it we're just stop stop there we're not getting into it Don't, don't, don't try to, don't try to start because you, you are in the wrong chat to start that conversation. I'm just, I'm just warning, I'm warning you preemptively. You are, you're in the wrong chat to start that conversation. <laughs> just, just to give you a warning there. Fear. Bassard then helped his friend cut it, her it, into it'll, several pieces. It'll turn into and mayhem in chat in a second, all right? William's version of events differed though. He claimed that Bassard had confessed to him just about taking safety. his mother's life and asked him to help get rid of her. Whatever the case, 
Neither man denied stuffing Tanya's chopped up remains into garbage bags and suitcases and dumping them around Morrisania. Even with both men in custody, investigators still took Bassett's phone and searched it for evidence, I expecting to find some incriminating Bassett, text messages like or Google home. searches. Instead, they found something much more damning and disturbing. A selfie that Bassett had taken of himself moments please, after the slaying, please don't tell in me which that's he posed like... alongside his mother. What the fuck? What the fuck? Jesus Christ, man! Others sliced off head. Why Bassett felt the need to take this photo and implicate himself is something only he can understand. Perhaps it was a morbid keepsake, or something he could show his inner circle as a way to either impress them or intimidate them. Hey bros, look what I got! Uh, what? Impress who? What do you you got a girlfriend at home or some shit like that who's into cutting off people's heads? Trying to impress her? What? Bassett eventually confessed to taking his mother's life after detectives found the power saw and other carving implements in the apartment he shared with her. In a video statement, he coldly stated, If you can kill somebody, you should be able to cut them up too. If you can't do that, if you don't have the stomach to cut them up, then you're a coward. <laughs> Spoken like a true alpha male. Dude, I guarantee this guy watches fucking Andrew Tate. <laughs> he just, he's just got Andrew Tate on repeat, man. Holy shit. As for a motive, the authorities say that Basig killed Tanya because, and I quote, she wanted him to grow up and move out and be a man. And apparently in his wow. mind, that was reason enough. Basig's legal Dear team Lord. tried to argue that their client had been hearing voices at the time of the incident. And as such, he couldn't be held responsible for his actions at the time. Needless to say, yeah, he didn't do it. The voices in his head did it. Defense. So his brain lie. did it. Not him, but his brain. The you judge. Know, the brain, the thing that controls your entire body. Yeah, that did it. Sentenced him to 25 years to life. Unfortunately, Bassett McLean wouldn't be the only member of his family to commit an act of evil. His ex-wife, Sarah Coombs. We're going to end the life. Dude, I told you it was. Maybe he was trying to impress his ex-wife. Of their four-year-old son, Zamir, after the boy had the audacity to accidentally drop an egg. After knocking him out with a broom, she tossed him, still breathing, into a plastic container of water. She only received 17 years. Why, dude? What the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck? Holy shit. On July 19th, 1991, 12-year-old Jared Michael Negredi embarked on his first overnight backpacking trip with the Boy Scouts. The group consisted of six scouts and a scoutmaster. That fateful evening, he and his troop were hiking to the 3,500-meter summit of Mount San Gorgonio, otherwise known as Old Greyback. Southern California's highest peak, located in San Bernardino National Forest. But at some point at around 6pm, just as the group had reached the top of the mountain, the scoutmaster came to a horrifying realization. Jared was missing. Duh. A separate group of hikers informed him that they had seen Jared walking down <laughs> the mountain alone, shortcutting. I don't know why this image is just funny to me. <laughs> Why, why is this funny to me? Staying on the trail. <laughs> Shortcutting a switchback. Cutting the switchbacks. That's to say, cutting Good through the vegetation. That? Maybe that's what it is. Maybe my brain is just poisoned by memes. The scoutmaster, an experienced hiker himself, rushed the remaining scouts down Old Greyback, expecting to pick up Jared somewhere along the way. They stuck to the trail the entire way down. I reached the designated meeting point at the base, but Jared was nowhere to be seen. The group hiked five miles in the dark back to their base camp, 
and hastily called for help. The subsequent search effort involved multiple law enforcement agencies, search and rescue teams, <coughs> and volunteers, with up to 3,000 people dedicating 45,000 hours to scour a 50 square mile area around the mountain. After three days oh. of searching, a footprint was uncovered on the mountain, one believed to match with Jared's high top tennis shoes. Beef jerky and candy wrappers were found nearby, but the most important thing the searchers found was Jared's camera. Oh shit. On the film roll were 12 pictures, and the final photo on it also happened to be the last photo ever taken of Jared Negretti. A close up shot of his eyes and nose, taken in the dark using the camera's flash. It's believed it was taken the same night he disappeared. Despite three decades of searching, no trace of Jared's remains have ever been found. Where Jared went and what became of him remain unknown. Dude, that's why I fucking the circumstances hate, surrounding like, his disappearance. National parks in the woods and shit. <clears throat> you could you could go out there, get lost, and no one will ever find you. These questions. That's just crazy. Particularly regarding why a scout leader allowed Jared, a first time camper, to hike alone while the rest of the group completed their ascent together. As anyone who's been in the scouts knows, the slowest hikers are typically placed in the middle of the pack to ensure that nobody gets left behind. As for what actually happened to Jared on that night in July 1991, there are three main theories. Firstly, that during Dude, his I don't, like, I don't fucking trust Boy Scout uh, camp leaders, dude. That is like, there are so many instances of Boy Scout camp leaders doing some shady ass shit, some weird ass shit. I think a Boy Scouts in general is just kind of weird. Um, you know, letting your 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 son go out in the middle of the woods with a random uh, adult, and you have no idea what's happening out there. Yeah, it's shit's weird, man. So it could easily just be the Boy Scout uh, leader that could have just killed him and gotten away with it. Solo descent down the mountain. Jared got lost. Night <clears throat> fell, and unable to see where he was going, he began taking photos using his camera's flash. It certainly wouldn't be the only time that something like this has happened. The theory brings to mind the infamous story of Chris Kremers and Lisa Anfroon, two Dutch women who got lost this. while hiking in Panama, and who, purportedly, used the flash on their phone cameras to guide their way through the darkness. They unfortunately didn't make it out of the jungle alive. Those who believe the same fate befell Jared <clears throat> hypothesize that shortly after taking this final photo of himself, he slipped and fell over Never one of the sheer drops yep. that line San Gorgonio, and that his remains are either still hidden somewhere in the thick brush, or were washed away by a river. The second theory is that Jared succumbed to one of the black bears that are known to inhabit the mountain. I mean, that black said, bears aren't really it that It seems unlikely though. that nobody else on San Gorgonio would have heard his screams for help. Which leads us to the most eerie theory of all. Theory 3 that Jared was picked up by someone, either as he descended the mountain alone, or when he reached the roadside at the bottom. I wouldn't be surprised. Given that almost every square inch of the mountain- Dude, if someone knows that there's a bunch of boy scouts in a certain area, it's like a predatory buffet. Has been thoroughly searched over the past 32 years. In the minds of many, that's the only way to explain why no trace of his body has ever been found. That being said, there's no concrete evidence that foul play was involved in Jared's disappearance. Then again, there's no concrete evidence to support any of the other scenarios either. To this day, it remains unknown what became of Jared Negretti, and this final image of him is the only real clue we have to work with. Just like what we talked about before with the whole, um, you know, cops and teachers situation is predators like going to predatory jobs or predatory positions or people who enjoy having power over others like to go to jobs that have power over other people. Like, for example, Boy Scout leaders. You literally get to hang out with a bunch of little boys all the time. Like, you know, it's just like. And I mean, don't even get me started on the church. Oh, 
Don't even get me started on the church. Yeah, priests and preachers, yeah. Oh, boy. <clears throat> they do zero background checks on that shit. Now it's time to walk away. I hope you enjoyed your stay. Did you laugh or cry or maybe subscribed? I'll thank you either way. You know I will miss you. I hope you return. Tell your friend or your mother to get me more views, please.